it's a little bit of irony because Roosevelt was not one to really say much or he wasn't a pro-free speech, pro-Bill of Rights president. He didn't even really depict himself so much in that way. So I think partly in a response to what you're seeing going on overseas, we get the four freedom speech and that becomes really identified in some ways with the administration. Join the best in the movement. It's Conservative Conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Tom Saroof, and I'm joined today by David Beto, who is a senior research fellow at the Independent Institute, as well as a professor emeritus of history from the University of Alabama. He's also the author of this new book, Out With the Independent Institute, The New Deal's War on the Bill of Rights. David, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. To start, how about you tell our listeners and my and me a little bit about yourself? Um, I mentioned some basic biographical information, but who are you? How did you become interested in these ideas, this topic, things of that sort? What are some of the other things that you've done throughout your career? Well, I've been knocking around for a while. I, I got my degree from University of Wisconsin, taught at UNLV for a while, and I've been at the University of Alabama for quite some time. I wrote a book on mutual aid, history of mutual aid. I wrote a book on taxpayers in revolts during the Great Depression. And I did another book that I'm still sort of working on projects spinning off from that about a civil rights leader named Dr. T.R.M. Howard. Uh, So those are some of the things that, that I've written. I've been working on this particular book on Roosevelt. It's the New Deal's War on the Bill of Rights is the beginning part uh, for about really off and on about 15 years. And it involves um, quite a lot of primary documents research as as well as an attempt to get on top of the secondary literature that's been written on this. But as you can see, it's a big topic. And I kind of regretted it about halfway in, but my wife sort of said, you got to keep going. And I did, but it it's it's a massive topic. Let's put it that way. Hey there, listener. I wanted to take a quick moment to thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations. This podcast is a production of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, and our mission here at ISI is educating for liberty. If you'd like to join us in fulfilling our mission, consider helping us by rating and reviewing this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to help us reach more listeners like yourself. Now, back to the show. Yeah, it really is. And as I'm reading through it, I haven't quite finished, but very well detailed, intricate detailed, but done in a way I think that's still not narrative history, but it tells a story or sort of weaves things so you can see the bigger picture. It's not just like, here's fact A, B, uh, sort of painfully dry and boring. So it's quite an interesting read. And I think sort of talking about the secondary literature a bit, the New Deal is, at least amongst conservatives, is sort of poo-pooed, I think, for a lot of the reasons that you're talking about in the book. But in the within the wider landscape, we sort of live in many respects in a New Deal regime. And that sort of entails, I think, or stems from the fact that the secondary literature on the New Deal has been, I think, positive or overlooking some of these various abuses that I think we'll get into. But I'm wondering just sort of as you're looking through or thinking about how you were doing the research for the last uh, decade and a half, how your reading of the secondary literature versus the primary literature, what that disconnect was. Well, it's we just see reminders all the time of how there's a disconnect. I mean, just today, I saw a news story where they had uh, rankings of presidents and Trump's the worst, whatever. But the one I paid attention to was who was that up there at the top? And it was Lincoln and then Roosevelt, ranked number second. Woodrow Wilson has taken a tumble. He used to be really the last poll just a, just three years ago or something like that. He was up there in the top 10. He's taken a tumble uh, because of the racism and so forth. But FDR still is his uh, racially problem problematic policies and other policies and civil liberties still really haven't caught up with him. So I don't know sure if I'm asking your question, but there's definitely a disconnect. Um, years ago, you know, I did a lot of reading about this period. I've done a lot of research about the 1930s. And the more I wrote, read about FDR, the more unappealing he became to me. Um, he seemed to have a very much 
whatever it takes attitude, by any means necessary attitude. And there was a, I guess you'd say, kind of a sense of intrigue, uh, a sense of that the public FDR was not very much like the private FDR, and a, a sense of kind of um, ruthless, ruthless behavior and sadistic behavior, I guess, at times as well. Um, so he's an interesting figure, but the public persona is very different than the private one, with one big exception. FDR, FDR could be very charming. Mm. Um, and he was very charming in his speeches, and, and in private, it could be very effective at persuading people to do things and feeling that they were being listened to and um, that he was he was taking their concerns seriously. Right, with the the sort of the fireside chats and the, you know, yeah. continuing to inspire hope. That's, I mean, one of the things that we talk about, or I sort of talked about, you know, in high school and in college learning classes, like he gave people the sense that there was something to hope for uh, still, even among, amongst the, the Great Depression and the, the beginning of World War II and then throughout the war. I'd be curious to learn before we start to dive into more of the the dark side of FDR, if you can orient us within the larger picture politically between the Democrat and the Republican parties in the 1920s and the 1930s, because I know that like FDR is a Democrat, his uncle, Teddy Roosevelt, is a Republican, but I know FDR was very influenced by TR, who is a progressive Republican in the early 20th century. So I'm wondering, I guess, how the landscape ideologically, philosophically um, changes where the Democratic Party becomes the big government uh, interventionist, progressive minded party and the Republican Party of the 20s and 30s, unless I have this wrong, becomes much more restraint oriented, um, sort of thinking Calvin Coolidge that um, a business is the business of the American people. And he's sort of uh, like more st stamping down on uh, expansionist, interventionist policies in the market or in people's lives. Um, but whereas earlier had TR and Taft, they're into trust busting and more um, aggressive federal policies. Yeah, that's a, you know, that's an interesting sort of question that leads to, to a lot of, uh, a lot of thoughts for me. One thing, a small, a small issue is that uh, Teddy Roosevelt was not the literal uncle of of Franklin Roosevelt, although I guess you could say he was in a sense, and then Eleanor Roosevelt was indeed Teddy Roosevelt's niece. And so he was an uncle by marriage. They were very distant cousins. However, early on, from childhood on, um, as Teddy Roosevelt is really making waves in the 1880s and 1890s, uh, he is referred to in the Franklin Roosevelt house, household as Uncle Ted, mm. right? So they, they call him Uncle Ted from an early stage. Franklin Roosevelt is brought up in a family that is a traditionally Democratic family. But I, I wouldn't read anything into that because when he was going to Harvard, for example, uh, he became a Republican. Franklin was head of the Republican Club at Harvard. He was a loyal supporter of Uncle Ted, and he probably would have run for office. He ran for state legislature in 1908. He probably would have run for a Republican if they'd have recruited him and if there had been an opportunity. So I don't think party, and if you look at him, he's fairly consistent. Party is not a driving force for Franklin Roosevelt. It is a political power, certainly, but it is also ideology, and that that can transcend party. Now, this transformation, well, I think you see a big rise of progressivism in the early 20th century. It really uh, spreads into both major parties, but I think arguably you could say it becomes more prevalent in the Republican Party. Um, I think a big change happened as a result of World War I. That was another mentor to Franklin Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson. Right. Because to fight the war, uh, and for ideological reasons, Wilson brings in a lot of very big government programs that become models for domestic interventionism during the New Deal. So those two people uh, who are driven more by ideology than party, I think, were the two, two of the prime influences on Franklin Roosevelt. 
and certainly by maybe in reaction to Wilson, where you have Harding come in as kind of a reaction to the Wilson's overreach, you get Harding, you get Coolidge. So you start to get, I think a lot of it is a reaction to Wilson and what Wilson did, which was seen as excessive, that you get normalcy, you get key cool Coolidge, and the Republican Party really moves more in that direction in some ways of a kind of party of restraint. Gotcha. That's helpful background. So then we have FDR. He's elected shortly after the Great Depression. Well, like, when's his first election? Nineteen, the election of what? Nineteen thirty. Uh, FDR is elected. Sorry, that phone's there. FDR is elected governor of New York in uh, nineteen twenty-eight, and then in uh, nineteen thirty-two, he's uh, elected president. Thirty-two. Okay. It's the Democratic nomination. He's elected president. Okay, and got then it. he serves all the way from thirty-three to when he dies in nineteen forty-five. Okay, that's helpful timeline-wise. Thank you. So, his big thing, what he's remembered for, what he's known for, probably why he sits number two at, atop the presidential rankings list, is the New Deal. Uh, I think a lot of our listeners will be familiar with what that is broadly. But what are some? What is the New Deal? If you were to describe it for someone who's not familiar or doesn't understand the scope, or um, what, like, what are some of the specific things governmentally or you know policy-wise that characterizes the New Deal? Well, of course, there's several phases to the New Deal. There's two main phases: thirty-three and thirty-five. And in the first phase, you have kind of uh, following uh, the World War I tradition, mm -hmm. sort of like, let's manage, let's plan the economy in some sense. So you get uh, two big agencies, the National Recovery Administration, which basically imposes price controls, wage controls, all sorts of controls on the economy, sets up this very complicated system where business kind of regulates themselves in partnership with government. you got the AAA where you get the same thing going on with farmers. Uh, so you get those. And then the second New Deal, 1935, Roosevelt really brings in a lot of stuff that, um, you know, um, uh, you know, still here, like uh, Social Security. Um, he, he also brings in uh, 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 the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, although that kind of go back, goes back earlier. Um, uh, but he brings in stuff. Well, the two big things he brings in in 35 is probably Social Security and the National Labor Relations Act, where we have these grand regulations. Federal government essentially subsidizes the growth of unions, beginning with the National Labor Relations Act. Um, but you have programs earlier like the WPA, for example, um, uh, you know, which is a government uh, a program to, to, to employ people. Right. What about the idea of the four freedoms? I think it's freedom from want, freedom from fear, freedom of speech. And then there's one that I is escaping me. How does that? Yeah, I was, I'm trying to remember too. freedom to worship, freedom of speech, freedom from want. Yeah. Freedom from fear. Um, yeah. Those come in and night. I'm, I'm get. I'm, I'm trying to remember now, 1941, where Roosevelt gives this, this famous speech sort of, prior to World War II, just prior to World War II, where he has this four freedoms concept, and he's known for that, right? Um, you can find all sorts of references to that. It's a little bit of irony because Roosevelt was not one to really say much or uh, uh, he wasn't a pro-free speech, pro-Bill of Rights president. He didn't even really... Uh, depict himself so much in that way. So I think partly in a response to what you're seeing going on overseas, we get the four freedom speech and that becomes really identified in some ways with the administration. But rhetorically, Roosevelt comes out of a very different progressive tradition. As I said, a kind of tradition of the important things, the means or the ends, a just society, a equal society, and government should bring about those that end. And we shouldn't worry so much about procedure. We shouldn't worry so much about constitutional procedure, niceties. We should achieve the end. And that is a driving force for a lot of progressives. And I think 
rhetoric to the contrary later, it is a driving force for Franklin D. Roosevelt. You know, and he says so. Like, why are you so worried about this, these legal protections or um, these, these uh, constitutional rules? we got something important to accomplish here. Right. And I think that gets into really at the start of your book, where you talk about the Black Committee and the Minton Committee. And rather than me explain them, why don't I have you explain them for the listeners? What are they? I had never heard of either of these things, by the way. Well, you're not alone. I I thought I knew a fair amount about this period. And then I guess as I was into my research, I came across these references to the Black Committee. The Black, what the heck is that? The infamous Black Committee. People, conservatives, libertarians were still using that terminology in the 1950s. In fact, some of that is driving them to maybe a reaction on the other side by that period. I said, well, what is that? And then eventually I worked my way back and found that the Black Committee was actually in the Mitten Committee, was were headline, headline news from 1936 to about 1938. Right. 35 to 38, really, but really 36 to 38 in a big well. Okay, well, there was a, there. why did the committee arise first? Well, the New Deal is sort of getting pushed back by about 1934, 35. This is often forgotten, but in the scientific polls, polls that generally got it right under Roosevelt, we see him slipping. Uh, his approval rating is slipping. The Democrats lose control of the New York legislature, for example. They lose control of some big city mayor positions. They lose congressional, you know, special elections. So there's there's really concern. And there are even polls showing Roosevelt losing in 1936. So they're concerned about that. So Roosevelt really says, look, we got to we got to investigate. We got to hit back at the, this rising opposition, these anti-New Deal organizations. And the Black Committee, that is really the underlying purpose. Now, the Black Committee is chaired by Senator Hugo Black. It's a Senate committee. Senator Black is from Alabama. He is an attack dog, very loyal to the New Deal, very much kind of almost like a Huey Long populist in his demeanor, mm -hmm. but a loyalist to the president and effective. All right. So they said, okay, we'll make Black head of this committee. The purpose of the committee is to investigate lobbying. And they say, of course, we'll investigate any lobby. Well, how do they define lobbying? Any attempt to influence public opinion, hmm. even a discussion like this, whatever, you know, that might have a spillover effect. And so it's very broad and open-ended. And they start calling, and Black starts calling in these New Deal figures. All of them are defined as lobbyists and tries to grill them. And they fight back quite effectively sometimes. So they come, Black Committee comes on a strategy in cooperation with Roosevelt. And this strategy is, what if we were able to get the private communications of these witnesses? All right, today you'd say, what if we were able to get their text messages? What if we were able to get their emails? It's kind of hard to do sometimes, even, you know, Senate committees to just get broad access to that. So what they do is they go, uh, they figure telegrams. This is the lead, leading method of long distance, long distance communication in the 1930s. It is very similar to emails and texts. It's almost instantaneous, sometimes instantaneous, because businesses will often have telegraphers there. Um, you don't Think about what you send. Sometimes you just send it. You don't really want it to be public because you, you know you're you're more candid. Very often, so they get access to these emails. Well, how are they going to get access to them? Well, there's a law, and that law requires the uh, telegram companies, the big ones, Western Union, to keep copies of all telegrams. And uh, so they go to Western Union, Black, the FCC. They get the FCC cooperation. Uh, because of the Roosevelt administration, they said, we want copies of all these telegrams. Here's what we want, for example. We want all incoming and outgoing messages that sent through Washington to every single member of Cong Congress for a nine-month period, right? And Western Union says, no, you, if you have a subpoena for something very specific, that's different. But they had no subpoena. It's an order. And Western Union refused, 
but FCC told them, you know, you're ordered. You have to do this. And they agreed. They, they, they did it. And so Black and his staffers, uh, FCC staffers, went in to Western Union, the big one, the big company, and they started searching all these messages, thousands a day, every member of Congress, incoming and outgoing. That added up over the search to at least 3 million telegrams. Wow. They went through and they copied stuff that was relevant. They were told what's relevant, anything having to do with lobbying. So the instructions to the people looking through these is, well, if you see stuff personal, just look past that. Look for anything having to do with lobbying, and that would be any attempt to influence ideas, any opinion about Roosevelt or whatever, right? Because that would be relevant, right? These are trying to affect public, and they got all these telegrams. And so that, that would mean that Black could call in, and I think some of these got to Roosevelt, and he used them for other purposes. I can't prove that. But the, he got these, and he would call these witnesses in, and he'd ambush them. On June 8th, you said this, or isn't it true you, you know, what? right? They were blindsided. Um, eventually, though, the committee starts to get into trouble because after they do this, the Black Committee starts going after specific individuals. Not just you know people who'd written a con congressman and starts to ask for their telegrams, and one of these individuals is a guy named Newton Baker, who was Secretary of War under Wilson, colleague of Roosevelt and Wilson administration. Baker is a moderate New Dealer, kind of a whatever, you know, easygoing character. He is so outraged by this that he says, "If I saw somebody trying to lynch Senator Black." I would not join the lynching party, but I would not stop them if they were putting the rope around his neck. Mm, That's wow. how angry it was. This was headline news, pushback, Black loses in the lower courts. But he stops his investigation so the courts don't feel they could really sanction him beyond stopping him, and it doesn't go to the Supreme Court. But it is a good, very, very valuable precedent for the future, and future committees could not do that. Okay, Black gets onto the Supreme Court. Why? Because of his role as a very effective attack dog for the New Deal. There's no two ways about it. That's why he's appointed. And he is on the court. Um, and his successor as head of the committee is his protege, Senator Sherman Minton of Indiana. Minton can't do the tele telegram search anymore. That's closed off. But and he, he calls in witnesses, but they push back. He's very frustrated. He tries to get information about uh, these newspapers and who backs them. And people start saying, hey, this isn't legit. You know, it's freedom of the press. And so he gets so mad that Minton proposes a bill in 1938 to make it a crime to publish anything known to be false. And he sells this as uh, disinformation. Hmm. Fake news. Roosevelt has a lot to say about that, too. And I think Roosevelt put Mitten up to it, but I can't 100 percent prove that. But he definitely Mitten was a definitely a very strong Roosevelt loyalist, perhaps even more so than Mitten was compared to Black. Any case, Mitten proposed this bill. And my God, it's amazing how much opposition there was almost immediately across the political spectrum. And this would not happen today, unfortunately, I don't think. And there is massive opposition, and Mitten has to pull his bill. And his committee is essentially discredited. He's discredited. He loses re-election in great part because of, of, of these actions. Um, although he later gets on the Supreme Court, interestingly mm -hmm. enough. But he, uh, those two committees, there's tremendous opposition. Tremendous opposition coming from certainly conservatives, libertarians, but also from a lot of Democrats to what these committees are doing. A lot of people in the ACLU, socialists, very different than today, where there is a core of people that are so dedicated to civil liberties, they'll defend the civil liberties of people who they don't like. And we see a lot more willingness to do that back in the 30s. And I don't think I'm being inaccurate here than we see now unfortunately. Yeah, I would agree with that assessment. But if I have the sort of the the impact of these two committees, right, is it basically that Roosevelt or at least Roosevelt, Roosevelt loyalists are more or less weaponizing 
these sorts of procedures or committees to more or less go after Roosevelt's political opponents, whether it be in the press or um, people who are financially or otherwise supporting people against various New Deal policies? Yes. And does is Black reporting directly to Roosevelt everything he does? Um, he doesn't really have to. They're well, working in tandem. They're working in cooperation. The administration is giving him tools such as access to private telegrams to the FCC, such as access to tax returns. Black just says, I want the tax returns of these people. He gets them, right? So there is cooperation in Roosevelt privately, you know, uh, people will challenge him on this and he'll, he's all for what both Black and Mitten are doing. He's, he's very strong, a strong defender of them. However, Roosevelt's very good about sort of distancing himself. Like, for example, on Minton's bill, I think Roosevelt was, was the guy who put him up to. That's my opinion. But when there is this immediate reaction against this, Roosevelt just jokes about it. And he says, basically, well, uh, if we had that bill enacted, the problem with it would be that there isn't enough room in the federal prison system <laughs> to put everyone in jail who would be guilty of publishing misinformation. And then he says to the reporters, you guys brought it on yourself, you know. And then he moves on to the next topic. So this gives you a sense of what his attitude was. But Roosevelt has deniability. He's he's a guy that's um, uh, very charming, very effective. He's very different than Trump in obvious ways. But there's similarities. One similarity is Roosevelt has his fireside chat and his speeches. He can go directly to the people. That's his theory. Trump has his had his Twitter, right? He has his own means of going directly to the people. However, Trump will be personalized things, make up nicknames about things. Roosevelt does that a little bit. But Roosevelt is very good at, at, at coming across like he's presidential and kind of above the fray and using humor, subtle humor very often, disarming humor against people who disagree with them. Nobody was more of a master, and I would include Reagan in that, at that kind of rhetoric, uh, rhetorical ability. Uh, some people said that Roosevelt would have been very successful as a radio announcer or radio commentator had he never run for office because he has a natural demeanor, natural voice for that kind of thing. And he knows it and he knows how to use it. Well, I mean, especially in Hoover didn't, by the way, Hoover didn't know how to use radio. No. Although Hoover was very important in creating radio regulation. He was, he was inept, but he also, he wasn't as ruthless. He wasn't as effective at using that means of communication as Roosevelt. Right. I mean, it makes sense that in a um, in a presidency and an executive branch that a sort of going along with this Wilsonian theory of government, of, of leadership in the executive, of a strong of a very strong executive that is basically running or managing an economy. You need a sort of gargantuan leader. So someone with the sort of charm and um, the suave to be able to move people in the right direction, whether that's congressmen to get your bills passed so that you can have this large sweeping power or people in the media to sort of sell it to the people and the ability to go to the people. That's still something very important that we see. And to call people into his office and convince each and every one, even if they totally disagree with each other, that he's on their side. Uh, I mean, he does this with people like A. Philip Randolph, for example. Randolph eventually pushes back and does his march, you know, really threatens to do his march on Washington. But Roosevelt was just trying everything in the book to charm the guy. Um, and he does that with others as well. And he usually succeeds. All right. We're just for the sake of time, I want to move to two different or two are sort of related issues. One being uh, FDR's relationship with uh, segregation and various sort of Southern Democratic bosses um, who are using Jim Crow for sort of electoral purposes that are advantage advantageous to both the New Deal and the, the Democratic Party. And then also on a related note, the uh, internment of uh, Japanese Americans during World War II. And I think they're related in the sense that when it's talked about as sort of black marks on FDR's record, record, they're sort of, they're either sort of brought in in the sort of uh, 1619 Project Critical Race Theory 
ask like this is systemic racism and FDR is a white man and he's living in this sort of systemic racism time or B it's something that is these are forces larger that he he has to contend with these forces and so it's not like his intellectual or his sort of social project to be a segregationist or to intern Japanese Americans But I'm wondering, as someone who studied these things, what your take on either of these reads of the history is. What is, as someone who's researched it, what do you take away from these two phenomena in his administration? Okay, well, the this is another reason why I'm surprised FDR. I'm, I guess I'm not, but why he hasn't sunk like Wilson has, because FDR did very little for African Americans as president. Uh, there were anti lynching bills; they'd been supported by his Republican predecessors. He never comes out in support of them. He could have gotten them through, probably. Even his own very conservative vice president, Garner, at one point said, my God, this lynching is out over the top. We have to do something. FDR's response to that was sort of laugh. Oh, Garner said that? You know, he really didn't do anything. He didn't appoint African-Americans to cabinet or sub-cabinet positions. They had something called the Black Cabinet, but that wasn't a real cabinet. Um, it was just black elect, you know, appointed officials who got together. Um, so he really didn't do anything in terms of fighting Jim Crow, in terms of fighting disfranchisement, in terms of civil rights. But he, you know, he, he, he talked a good game, I guess you could say. Now, Roosevelt had a very close relationship with city bosses. Mm -hmm. There was one that was very important. It supported Roosevelt since 1931. He was boss Crump. He was the head of the Memphis Democratic machine. He was a Roosevelt loyalist, um, and he used New Deal money quite effectively in the 1930s. He got a lot of it. But there was a Republican Party in Memphis, and this party had been sort of I don't know, sidelined and Crump had it, kind of been able to limit its reach. But you actually had blacks voting in Memphis and you had them controlling the Republican Party, Shelby County. And uh, they got a very aggressive black leader there named J.B. Martin, who was the head of the National Negro Business League, a very wealthy guy, uh, loyal Republican. And he decides in 1940, he said, I think we can carry Tennessee for, for Roosevelt or for Wilkie, the Republican. It had gone Republican in the 1920s, so it's not totally unreasonable. And he organizes these big multiracial rallies in Memphis. Um, and Trump, the city Democratic boss, is upset. He threatens him. He says, you do another one of these rallies, I will police your store. Well... Martin went ahead. What happens just that day after the second rally, the next rally, policemen are searching every customer coming in and out of Crump's drugstore. They do this for weeks and weeks. They search them. Little kids coming in uh, to buy ice cream cones. Priests, you know, everybody, white and black are searched. They harass them. And he harass them in other ways too. Ultimately, they sort of threaten to prosecute uh, 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 Martin on trumped up charges. And Martin just says, I, I, I can't die in the workhouse. Uh, he leaves. He comes back one more time in 1943 to watch a baseball game at a stadium he had helped to build. He was very successful in Chicago. He is arrested, brought to the police department and told to leave. Um, and he does. This kind of thing happens to other black leaders that is blatant. There are complaints made to the Department of Justice. Um, there is willingness from the head of civil rights division to prosecute because it's so over the top, but it's vetoed at the top. Crump is close to Roosevelt. He's important to Roosevelt, 1944 again, um, and nothing happens. Um, and that is an example of, 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 of Roosevelt on race with regard to African-Americans. Now, the Japanese internment is an interesting issue. It is what my colleagues in the history department, history profession often do is they'll say, well, like you said, he kind of had to do it. Or they'll say things like maybe he shouldn't have done it. But there was such hysteria. Right. There was such a demand that, you know, 
he did it, but maybe he shouldn't have. But hey, man, what, what else could he have done? Well, first of all, after Pearl Harbor, there was very little demand, contrary to that view, for Japanese internment. Papers in California were defending their rights. Uh, the guy that later took charge of internment, DeWitt, said they're American citizens after all. But Roosevelt let this fester, opened the door, basically never spoke out in defense of Japanese Americans and kind of let hysteria develop, didn't try to manage it. And even then, there wasn't that much hysteria. Um, and uh, he signs ex the executive order in February, which, again, you're talking about uh, two, two months after Pearl Harbor, interning the Japanese Americans. And if you look back, it all made sense. Roosevelt had written anti-Japanese op-eds back in the 1930s where he endorsed California's policy of denying property rights to Japanese immigrants, for example. He said privately in 1936 as president, well, we should put Japanese Americans, any Japanese American who meet, who had met Japanese ships, visited the sailors before a future war, in the event of war, we should put them in concentration camps. So he was inclined in that direction, but he was not, his hand was not for, enforced. Roosevelt is the decider. That's what historians say, tell us after all, and I think they're right. He's on top of things. He reads a whole bunch of newspapers every day. He knows what's going on. He's getting advice. He's getting information from a lot of people who don't think he has to do this, including his own attorney general. So he's often portrayed as this clueless character who's carried by the moment, has other things on his mind. We never hear that about Roosevelt earlier during the New Deal. But suddenly when it comes to Japanese internment, we get FDR depicted as kind of a clueless figure who's reactive, who's distracted, um, and who really can't maybe, it's not put that way, you can't blame him as much for this because there's all this other stuff going on, right? That's the argument. And it just sort of, he defers too much to the military. You get that argument, although there were military people that were against internment that he could have sought out. For example, the military commander in Hawaii pretty much stops internment there uh, by dragging his feet and using other methods. FDR wanted to intern Japanese Americans in Hawaii. That was 40% of the population. He wanted to move them to a smaller island, but was eventually told, look, if you try that, you know, we're going to have to take ships away from, I don't know, Midway, or, right? We're going to have to take them from the Pacific War Zone to transport all these people. Logistic problems will be a tremendous. The political problems will be tremendous, right? So they don't do it. So Japanese Americans in Hawaii are not interned, partly because the military commander there pushes back. But that really is an excuse. FDR is letting this happen. Um, he knows what's happening, and it was unnecessary. His own attorney general said so. This is often forgotten, rarely quoted for some reason. But FDR's attorney general was Francis Biddle. Biddle was very much against internment, said so, and even said in his biography, he said, look, there wasn't that much demand for it, really outside of maybe Southern California. And even there, it wasn't that overwhelming. He didn't have to do this. Uh, um, J. Edgar Hoover is against internment. Secretary of Interior Ickes. Plus, even more people think that Roosevelt should have ended it in, before the 1944 election. But Roosevelt, someone said that Roosevelt's, you know, Churchill has the you know, the uh, whatever, the victory sign. What are the other ones? I'm forgetting somebody else has another sign, but Roosevelt has, has this, you know, the wet finger. Uh, uh, <laughs> and and he, it's quite clear. He keeps them there, even though everybody tells him, look, there's no emergency anymore. And Japanese are performing so well in the military. You let him go. Keeps him there after the 44 election. Didn't have to. But in any case, there are a lot of people urging Roosevelt against this at the top levels of the federal government. Um, so it's not like he's operating from a vacuum.
Right. And so if this is an executive order, what's the congressional reaction um, to what's a pretty blatant civil rights abuse? Well, um, they they go along with it. You know, he's the president. He you know, the, the argument is it's it's national emergency. People aren't going to second guess it. Now, the closest you get to pushback on the floor is Senator Robert Taft, mm -hmm. Republican of Ohio conservative and Taft basically looks at because they did send an authorizing law to Congress, which is vague and open ended. Um, and and Taft looks at this and he says, I, this is uh, the worst piece of legislation I've ever seen. He basically says this could be applied to anyone, because if you look at the executive order and the authorizing legislation, Japanese Americans are not mentioned a single time. Very open ended wording persons who must be removed, that kind of language. And, and But Taft then says, given the situation on the West Coast and the sense of national emergency, I won't fight this. But that's the closest you get to somebody in Congress actually pushing back. They're inclined to defer to Roosevelt. And by that time, a lot of hysteria has developed. So a lot of hysteria develops really after executive order 9066 is issued. And uh, in, in people often quote polls from that period a month after that show support for internment, but that's after. And you get movies coming out. Just saw one, it was the first Batman movie, you know, just came out. And in these movies are really playing this up. Um, but people, you know, that came later. That so it's almost, later. almost like the law created the hysteria or created the sense of the need. Yeah, not just the law, but FDR's failure and people urged him to do this. Why don't you make a speech, Mr. President? He was told this by a very close advisor, calming the situation down. And it would have been a good PR, right? right? We are so much committed to the four freedoms that we will ensure them for our Japanese American population. That is how much we believe in this. Very good PR. So it's sort of inexplicable in a way. Uh, but, you know, FDR doesn't have the imagination to do that kind of thing or the inclination to do that. And he could have. He could have quite easily made a speech like that or made commentary like that and would have had a lot of people, you know, behind him. He's not forced to do this. <laughs> sure. OK, so thinking a little bit in more big picture, we've talked about weaponizing subpoenas to, if not jail, but harass or investigate political opponents and political detractors of the New Deal, doing the same thing using city bosses to uh, disenfranchise African-Americans who had already been disenfranchised through various parts of the South with Jim Crow, um, but cracking down on that uh, for his for FDR's political gain, interning Japanese during World War II, various significant civil rights, human rights abuses, violations of the Bill of Rights. How does this fit with the policies of the New Deal with just increasing government power in the economy or increasing government power to manage the Great Depression or using war power? Like, I guess the question would be something like, do we need these things in order to have the New Deal? Um, or are these sort of sorts of excesses of FDR's character um, or of his views of government? Okay, I think that's a, a complicated question. Could you have had a new deal without Japanese internment? Yeah, I think you could. Mm -hmm. However, there are connect interconnections there that are worth looking at and worth noting. Very big one is one of the signature New Deal agencies is the Works Progress Administration, the WPA. When you think of New Deal, that's you know, one of the top five examples people come up with and you have all these wpa projects throughout the country and you see the wpa marker and all this very good pr well the wpa is still around it doesn't isn't shut down 1943 between up till no, uh, november 1942 and again the internment begins months before that the wpa spent more on internment than any other agency including the military. 
Um, and a lot of the people who staff these camps are WPA people. They eventually phase out the WPA because it's sort of unpopular. But basically what happens to the WPA functionaries, a lot of them end up as administrators of the camps, um, building the camps. So there is a very interesting connection there. Now, it's not so much to the New Deal, but to the U.S. Census, which is a pre-New Deal agency, but it's certainly been expanded in the 30s. And that in the, and the census is very much uh, part of Japanese internment. So you see these interesting interconnections. But certainly, I think you could imagine a world where someone like a Francis Biddle, who was pro-New Deal, pro-Roosevelt, really, dedicates his book to Roosevelt, even though he makes these harsh comments, you could have had, you could have had, you know, it wasn't, didn't have to happen even under, it, it wasn't inevitable towards the New Deal. I would associate more with just Roosevelt. I'd say this is Roosevelt. Acting, I guess, from ideas that, that are not interconnected, that are not disconnected from his other ideology. So I don't think I, I wouldn't buy that there's a dichotomy there necessarily, but it wasn't necessary under the New Deal. Gotcha. And I'm just curious, sort of thinking in terms of contemporary issues, there are some who are you know conservative or on the political right who are starting to embrace parts of the New Deal, um, whether it's saying we're not going to touch Social Security, which is some, a plank or a sort of live issue in the 2024 race, but even embracing the idea of like Catholic New Deal or um, this sort of this moniker. And I'm just wondering, as somebody who studied the period, what you think of that? Well, again, the book is 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 not about Social Security. It's not about economics and so forth. So I, I always tell people if they're on the left, I've gotten into some discussion with people on the left, said, read this book. I got one person that uh, praised it named Ellen Schrecker, very much pro New Deal, left wing historian. And to her credit, She's written a lot about McCarthyism. I sent her the book and she gave me a nice little blur. So it is a book that left and right can appreciate, I think, right? Now, you were asking about, um, uh, uh, oh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's unfortunate that a lot of people on the right uh, look back at these things and sort of throw up their hands. I think we... We do need, you know, in Social Security, I'm somebody that thinks it would be a good idea to have some sort of private alternative to that where people could put in money. We do that for school vouchers. That's one area where you're getting a little bit of the contrary happening. You're getting that movement, I think, coming out of the COVID crisis really is far more advanced than anybody could have imagined the school right, choice absolutely. movement a few years ago. So things are, are are kind of inconsistent, I guess you could say. But you have that movement, really a ground up movement to a great extent, or at least not ground up necessarily, but building on what's happening at the grassroots level where people are just saying, my God, you know, my kid's out of school. All right. What am I going to do? All right. You know, doesn't anyone care about this? All right. Um, and, and, and saw what a disaster that was. Well, as an institution like ISI, which has been, you know, sort of raising the alarm bells, this is in, mostly in higher education we've been doing this, but now we're seeing uh, a lot of the, the problems with higher education are now percolated not only into K through 12, but also various other facets of, of life from, you know, school boards and, uh, it, you know, uh, like Fortune 500 company, uh, boards of directors, things like that. Um, yeah, that's it's no surprise that now we're starting to see we're finally starting to see a large ground squell pushing back. Cause people are now seeing um, seeing the problem for themselves. Um, I guess maybe last question for you, David. Um, I've appreciated your time. It's been a great discussion. I encourage everyone to go by and read the book. Um, but when we're thinking big picture about what World War Two and what the 1930s and 40s are about, um, you have leaders, Hitler, Stalin, Mussolini. Uh, who are totalitarian. They have never before in history the means, but also the desire to en engage in complete control over their society. Um, and they're committing serious civil rights abuses, human rights abuses. And then on the other side, you have Roosevelt, who during just prior to the war and then during mm -hmm. the war, America is the, the land of the free. And we're fighting against totalitarianism and evil. 
Um, and I think in large part that's correct because um, Hitler, Mussolini, and Stalin are certainly not remembered well, and they shouldn't be. But I just it's interesting having read some of um, the things that you're outlining and documenting in the book. Not that he's that FDR is doing things um, of the scale or the scope or the um, the viciousness of those other leaders, but um, there's this, you know, there's usually he's using propaganda, he's silencing or seeking to silence and harass opponents, he's locking up undesirable people. Um, I'm just wondering, thinking, I guess, just about the era, what about charismatic, powerful leaders um, is so important or so prescient at that time, and what that sort of teaches us as students of history about the importance of liberty and the importance of, of freedom, which is sort of, I guess, gets in the in the grand scheme of things gets um lost because fdr is seen as being like the bastion of freedom and the united states is being the bastion of freedom but there's a, maybe more similarity than um is often oftentimes assumed yeah there's a lot there uh, i would say first of all uh that i'm you know when i use terms like concentration camps i'm not saying that these are the same right or comparable to the death camps under hitler I'm not saying that. However, it's a legitimate label, in my view. It's the label FDR used. He used it as late as 1944. He called them concentration camps. And they are distinct from the internment camps that you see for Italians or German-Americans in the sense that if you have the wrong ancestry, you go to them, right? They're even sending kids from orphanages there. Uh, Said so they're Japanese, American, therefore they go to the camp. You don't get that with Germans or Italians. Now, yeah, there's some interesting parallels here. The use of media, uh, uh, certainly, uh, uh, you know, the, the charisma. You know, I wouldn't say that so much Stalin. He's not a very charismatic figure. That's maybe a bit of a difference. But certainly he's got a propaganda apparatus behind him that's quite effective. And if you look at, you know, um, Roosevelt, Mussolini, Hitler, you know, and the use of the media, um, there are, you know, there are some definite uh, parallels and there's some differences. FDR is really the guy, though, that is that is the master of what I'd call the soft strategy. Right. He is not a guy like a Hitler, Mussolini. Some, in some ways, he's more in tune with the media of the period and that he is able to use subtlety, a more of a quiet uh, approach rather than the old, and Hitler and Mussolini are really in kind of an old school, right? The, the or, or Huey Long, right? They're, you know, the table pounders, they're the, the orders. So it's, it's, there's some similarities and there's some differences in that sense. I'm not sure if that's answering your question, but. No, it's the perfectly fine answer. I wasn't looking for anything in particular. Just no. noticed the peril and wanted to pick your brain. Um, well, David, I, again, I appreciate your time. I think we can end it there. If I, Again, the book is The New Deal's War on the Bill of Rights um, out with the Independent Institute. But David, if there's anything else that you want to share with our listeners in terms of where they can find your other work um, or other books that you want to plug, where, where can people find you? Yeah, I would, you know, I would patronize if you can you get you get my book on amazon but but i would certainly go to independent.org and you can get my book there on um roosevelt you can get some of my other work including my biography of dr trm howard who was a guy that was very important civil rights figure and Mattel's case he did an investigation his her mother stayed with him uh so he was a key leader so you get that stuff uh, out of the book, I would say just real briefly, I think there's a hopeful aspect to the book that I, I want people to see. And that is you have a movement on the left and on the right pushing for civil liberties. Um, we don't have that as much now. You have the AOCs of that time, Norman Thomas, being very strongly pro-civil liberties for everyone. That's, and I think conservatives can learn a lesson from that as well, of defending the rights of people they disagree with. And we need we need more of that. And I think there are some good examples from the 1930s and the 1940s of that. Well, just another reason to read the book. So thanks again, David. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. 
If you've enjoyed this episode, be sure to check out our website at isi.org resources to see all that we offer our members, including the intercollegiate review, select modern age articles, debates, lectures, and of course, this podcast. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review, and we will see you next time on Conservative Conversations with ISI.